Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is the 21st of August of 2020, and the article I'm going to be discussing was published in Critical Care Medicine on the 14th of August of 2020. And the title of the article is Timing of Intubation and Mortality Amongst Critically Ill Coronavirus Disease Patients, a Single-Centered Cohort Study. I always have to give the disclaimer that none of this is medical advice, guys. The citations for everything I'm going to be saying are going to be in the show notes. So read that if you want to learn more about what we're discussing today. And this is my interpretation of the article. It could definitely be wrong because I am human. To be quite frank, I was pretty excited when this article was published in Critical Care Medicine because at the end of the day, those of us who take care of COVID patients in the ICU, you know, we don't really know what is the best thing to do for our patients with regards to intubation. I mean, we learned really early in the course of the pandemic that proceeding with early intubation was not beneficial to our patients. And all of us have seen those patients who are on high flow nasal cannula, who have a PaO2 of 50 to 55 on their blood gas, on 60 liters and 100% FiO2. And you go ahead and you intubate these people. And next thing you know, they're on PEEPs greater than 15, 100% FiO2. Their stats are in the toilet. You know, they're hemodynamically unstable. I mean, some of these patients just don't really like the ventilator. And so I'm, I'm really afraid that history is not going to be kind to us with how we took care of these patients. You know, we look back at certain trials that took place in the 50s, 60s, and we're like, wow, these people are, are barbarians. Like, why did they do that? But, but in all honesty, they didn't know any better. And, and I'm just fearful that in the future, we're going to say to ourselves like, wow, I can't, I can't believe we took care of patients this way. And that, you know, in some cases, <laughs> were we even causing harm? It's, it's just very troublesome to me. But getting back to the actual paper itself, by no means uh, is this very robust data. After all, it's a retrospective study. And good prospective data just does not exist. Again, we're, we're in a pandemic. And I really have to thank the team over at Emory who took the time to look at this data to at least provide us with some insult, insight. <laughs> I almost said insult. Uh, to provide us with some insight as to, you know, is, is withholding intubation causing any harm to our patients? Because at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to avoid harming our patients and improve outcomes. One of the first things to consider is, you know, how do we even decide to proceed with intubation in COVID patients? And this is where I think that we shouldn't try to reinvent the wheel here. You know, we all use a different number of parameters to help us decide when to pull a trigger with intubation. A lot of times, and this is just to put it lightly, <laughs> the RTs who I work with give me the look where they just give me the look and I know that the patient needs to be, needs to be intubated. A lot of it also has to do with, obviously, the hypoxemia, hypercapnia, hemodynamic compromise, all, all those things. But don't ever forget about the eyeball test, which holds some good weight. A lot of times, some clinical gestalt will get you a long way. But the honest question that we've asked ourselves in this whole pandemic is, are we waiting too long? And that's something that honestly burdens me as well as the team that I'm taking care of. You know, there is something called a ROX score, R-O-X, which gives you an indication on when to intubate patients who are on high flow nasal cannula. But that's that's something that a lot of people for for one reason or another have thrown out the window with regards to taking care of COVID patients. Well, the next question should be, what did the authors do? Well, they performed a retrospective look on their COVID patients in several different ICUs in several different hospitals in Atlanta, Georgia, where the patients were either on high flow nasal cannula or the team proceeded with intubation. People have wondered over the course of this pandemic about aerosolization of COVID with high flow nasal cannula, but Emory had a policy stating that this was no big deal. They were, however, against using non-invasive ventilation, which is, you know, in the medical lingo, what a lot of us call BiPAP. A caveat is that if you do use non-invasive ventilation on these patients, you have to really be careful with the IPAP settings because you don't want patients taking these enormous, enormous tidal volumes, which cause barrel trauma and other such trauma to the lungs. In total, they reviewed 231 patients. 47.2 of these patients were on high-flow nasal cannula, and 42% of these patients were intubated even before trying high flow nasal cannula. At the end though, the high flow nasal cannula system saved about 
well, not about, but they saved 28 patients from needing intubation. And, you know, avoiding intubation is a good thing because of all the things that go through that come along with it. You know, like sedation, weakness, length of stay, all, all those things that are too much for the scope of this podcast. The next thing we're all wondering is what did the authors find? For the sake of simplicity and to try to make a podcast as enjoyable as possible, I'm not going to get into all the statistical analysis. You can find that on the show notes if you just download the article for yourself. But the authors, quote, found no association between time to intubation and either mortality, ventilator duration, or ICU length of stay, even after accounting for patient comorbidities, clinical presentation, and severity of illness. They also found no association between the timing of intubation and subsequent oxygenation as measured by the initial PF ratio or static compliance. Ultimately, the authors concluded that although, you know, this was a retrospective study with all the limitations that come with a retrospective study, that their analysis provides reassurance that, quote, delays in intubation are not significantly associated with further lung injury in this vulnerable population of critically ill patients. As I mentioned before, using high flow nasal cannula saved 20% of their patients from needing intubation and everything associated with it. So yeah, that's cool. But the next question we're all wondering is how long did they delay? Some of us in the real world have had patients on high flow nasal cannula for weeks at that matter. You know, this allows patients to be able to eat and talk on the phone or FaceTime and whatnot. It makes them pretty comfortable. And then this information could be teased out in the article from the fact that the median time to intubation, obviously for those patients who ended up intubated, and for those who lasted greater than 24 hours on high flow, was 2.3 days, with a range of one day to 8.3 days. They don't discuss how long that 28% of patients who remained on high flow nasal cannula and didn't buy the endotracheal tube remained on high flow nasal cannula. So that's something that would be interesting to look into. I guess I got to read the supplementary data a little bit deeper. Maybe I missed it. Who knows? But again, this is a good time to remind you to read the article for yourself and not trust me, as I could always miss things. And ultimately, a hat tip to the authors. There are some interesting facts with regards to the patients that underwent intubation for COVID. And a lot of times in these articles, we could tease out what they're doing at these facilities to better take care of these patients. And here's some interesting facts. Patients who had a PF ratio of less than 100, which based on their Berlin criteria is considered to be severe ARDS, carried a 43% mortality. The median duration of mechanical ventilation was nine days. And the median ICU length of stay was 12.8 days. This all seems pretty good. I think they're doing a good job over there, Emory, taking care of these patients. And if you're you're curious about the inflammatory markers, you know, they were checking CRPs as well as other parameters on these patients. The CRP, what it says is it was 176 milligrams per deciliter. Although I really think that there's a typo on the units there and either they meant milligrams per liter or micrograms per milliliter. I could be wrong on that. The D-dimer was also elevated at 1.4 micrograms per milliliter. But these, these folks did not make any specifications as to whether or not the patients were on anticoagulation in this paper. And obviously, since this is a, a study that's comparing intubation versus high flow to some degree and the timing of it, they didn't get to any of the treatments that the patients were receiving to, you know, improve outcomes. Because at the end of the day, the need for high flow nasal cannula or the ventilator is just, it's just to keep them alive until their underlying inflammatory process gets better. To conclude this podcast and to wrap things up, I do have to give the disclosure that I am a consultant for a company that basically sells the high flow nasal cannula system, and I'm a big proponent of it. That's the reason why I work with them, but I am not getting any type of financial compensation or anything like that for creating this podcast. I just found it to be pretty interesting because, you know, despite anything, we have to worry or be concerned or look into the fact that there may be better strategies to take care of our patients than that that we are currently doing. And it appears as if this data showing that the outcomes were the same for patients who are intubated early versus being intubated a little bit later in the course of their hospitalization show no difference in mortality is a little bit reassuring. And the part that makes me the happiest and to some extent what I've actually seen in the hospital in my practice 
is that you can keep 28% of patients out of needing intubation by using the high-flow nasal cannula system, which is an outcome that definitely my patients, their families, everybody, <laughs> everybody's happy about because, again, when you intubate these people, oh, they get they get sick, they get real sick, and obviously, some people need intubation. Don't take the don't take the context of this podcast and this article that you know try try to avoid every, intubation on everybody and let people crash and burn on high flow. If if somebody needs to be intubated, they need to be intubated. So, I guess I guess that's it for today. Hope you guys have a really good day. Um, if you're listening to this on a podcast. I would greatly appreciate a good review or five stars on whatever medium you're listening to this on. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, I would appreciate a thumbs up, like, subscribe, share, all that fun stuff that we're supposed to say. Have a great day, guys. Bye.